The Evan Rad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Women listeners should check out the Vans Viaje snowboard boot, which is taking cues from some of Vans' snow team's most demanding riders, including longtime Vans pro Hannah Beeman. This boot is built for the backcountry journey woman to excel in a variety of conditions. It features the BOA Custom Focus Plus, which allows for micro adjustability and a dynamic dual zone configuration that ensures unlimited on the fly flex control and superior heel hold for the most demanding riders in all varieties of extreme conditions. Check out the Viahi at your local van snowboard boot dealer. Season 6 of F and Rad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, The Boardroom Snowboard Shop, Anon Optics, Crow's Nest Barbershops, Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C., and Stance Socks. Crow's Nest Barbershops have been a part of the F and Rad family since the beginning because that's what's important to Crow's Nest founder John Roth, family. If you live in Vancouver, Ottawa, Collingwood, Hamilton, Toronto, or Honolulu, visit your neighborhood Crow's Nest Barber and join the Crow's Nest family finest quality crow's nest barbershop support for season six also comes from grouse mountain and mount seymour i've enjoyed a few rad days up grouse lately including my best resort day of the season grouse has incredible fall line minimal lineups and helpful friendly staff from the parking lot up to the top of the mountain it's also pretty rad they've got a couple of free electric car spots and their tram eliminates the majority of the mountain drive Book your tickets online today or download the Grouse app. I'll see you up there at Grouse Mountain, the peak of Vancouver. Natasha Zurich is a Vancouver-raised professional snowboarder who paved the path of progression for women snowboarders around the world. I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to having a snowboarder from your home mountain make it big on the world scene. That's Natasha for me. As a kid snowboarding in Vancouver, Devin Walsh recognized her style and advocated for her to join the Never Team. She quickly caught the eye of the Burton team manager at the U.S. Open, and the rest is history. She's been mentioned in many episodes, and I'm excited to have her on the show. Here's Natasha Zurich, interviewed a few weeks back at her home in the Okanagan. Yeah, I was just talking with Leanne Pelosi, and she said that she came up and interviewed you for the Full Moon Project. Yeah. But it was her first time using her new recorder, and she messed up the audio. So she was really sad that you weren't in the, included in the project. Yeah. When she came visited me in Penticton, that was probably the only time since you came to talk to me since I retired from snowboarding that I did any sort of interviewish type conversation. I, I hear about you all the time in podcasts. You get mentioned a lot. You know, you blazed a path. And also you had a lot of integrity. I think that's what I think that's what it, keeps you in the hearts and minds of women snowboarders. Yeah, well, it's nice to be known as someone who has had integrity, even though I felt like I was struggling with keeping integrity. But I think overall, I was able to maintain it pretty well. You've recently come out of your shell and become a little bit more extroverted since you started painting, maybe. No, I think that's actually the opposite happened because when I paint, I can sit for like five or 10 hours in my room by myself and I don't talk to anybody. Yeah. And all of a sudden, if I'm asked to hold a conversation with someone, I have to switch my brain mode to uh, from like, you know, speaking a language that's visual with my hand to switching my brain so that actually words come out of my mouth and make any sense. <laughs> and then I start feeling kind of shy and super awkward and self-conscious even Interesting. Did you grow up speaking, is it Polish that your family's Polish? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you spoke Polish? Polish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And until what age? When did you start speaking English? I spoke, I started to learn English at six when yeah. I moved to Canada. So you moved to Canada at six years old? Yeah. That would have been scary. Well, it was exciting because uh -huh. I was young and my dad was already in Canada for three years. Oh, wow. Because he escaped Poland because it was a communist government and he didn't want to live in that regime. That's, so, that's incredible. What's his story? How did he, how did he escape? Um, he was a mountaineer for the Polish national expedition team. So he would go out with his buddies in crews to uh, summit mountain peaks, like whether it was Himalayas or Pakistan or... In this instance, they decided to uh, summit Mount McKinley in Alaska. 
but the plan with him and a few others were that they're just using as a, as an excuse to leave Poland and that they didn't actually have any intention of coming back. Incredible. Yeah. I grew up uh, being young, seeing like army military guys with machine guns just patrolling the streets. Wow. And apparently my mother had to stand in line uh, to buy bread and other line to buy meat with allocated food stamps per family members that let you know how many amounts of food you were able to bring back home. That's unbelievable. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a sister. She's one year younger. Oh, man. So from from age three to six, you're just, your mom's getting stuff ready to get you the heck out of there. Yeah, trying to apply for visas and uh, exit permissions. And I think the government fell like in the early 80s. So then that was when basically it was, we were given the opportunity to move to Canada and be with my dad and immigrate. Oh, what was that like to see your dad after three years of not seeing him? Yeah, I think he was my hero. And I was really sad that I couldn't see him. And it really like gutted me and affected me in a lot of way. And so when I got to see him, I was really looking forward to it. And I had just so many good memories. And he brought us bananas to the airport, but because we had asked for them because we couldn't get bananas in Poland, but they weren't ripe. <laughs> They were like green bananas. And then we thought, what the hell? These are disgusting. We didn't like bananas since that point. Also, the first time we ate at McDonald's, we puked. Because we weren't used to that kind of food. You guys threw up. So like, did you grow up not liking McDonald's because of that? Or, or did you try and learn to um, like it? No, I was. we were really poor because we were immigrant. And I remember being like 15 and having to bum French fries off my friends at McDonald's because I couldn't afford to buy French fries. <laughs> Unreal. So did your dad move you guys to North Vancouver? Is that is that where you... No, we were on 15th and Main. First Coquitlam and then 15th and Main. And that was really sweet because that was a straight bus ride from Main Street to get to uh, Grouse Mountain. Yeah. When I started snowboarding when I was uh, 15. Well, I when I was 14, but at 15, I was busing up to the mountain after school. I'd keep my snowboard in my locker. I chose all the kind of classes that didn't give you homework, like woodworking, metalwork, working, and a couple of art classes. So then I didn't have to have textbooks in my locker and I could fit my boots and my snowboard in there. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's so sick. So you, when I would first have seen you would have been those days at Grouse. So you would finish school, you grab your board. Would you put your boots on at school or would you put them on once you got to the mountain? I'd, uh, I'd literally just wear them uh, from school on the bus. Yeah. Yeah. And then that way, when you get there, you're yeah. ready to go. Just untied. So it wasn't so cramped. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd ride the bus, go on the tram yeah. and come up and, and ride till 10 and then come down and my mom would pick me up at night. Oh, that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. So your parents knew like, oh, she loves this. How did you choose snowboarding? That seems. Cause my dad was really into skiing and for some reason, it just, I'm 13 and I'm like starting to be a teenager and I'm starting to want to do my own thing. Like then at that point, skiing is dad's thing. And I see snowboarders and it just looked like the coolest thing. And I just had to do it. So it took me a year to just bring up the courage to uh, think, okay, I can actually try snowboarding because that I was a girl. I actually felt a lot of uh, limitation in my mind that I couldn't and I shouldn't be doing this. And that there weren't any girls really to be an example for me, that it's okay. So it took a lot of courage. It took about a year, but I so desperately wanted to do it. Where had you seen it? Just like skiing with your dad? Yeah, at uh, Seymour, Grouse Mountain, Cyprus. Yeah. And he would take you and that would be like your daddy daughter time. Like Yeah, and my sister. And your sister would go mm -hmm. too. Oh, that's so fun. Did she take up snowboarding? No, she stick she sticks with skiing. Still now even. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. So when you go to get a snowboard, do you rent one at first or do you wind up uh convincing your dad to buy you one? I rented one at first and it was like way too big and ridiculous, <laughs> like trying to snowboard on a garage door. Yeah. Uh, so right away, my dad bought me a snowboard. Like he was so cool. He was just like, yeah, that's cool. Great. Let's get you a snowboard. I don't know how we can afford it, but he just bought me one. And, uh, and then I was snowboarding in it with my ski boots for a few times. <laughs> and then, and then at that point I was like, this is ridiculous. And then I needed s snowboard boots. So I got air walks. Oh, wow. That's sick. So what board was it? 
uh, Burton Air 5.1. It was red. Yeah, the red Air 5.1. Mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. an awesome board. Yeah, iconic, like deep in my heart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, so that year, all the boards were kind of similar. Like the Kelly Air and the Air Series were, were really, really close to the same board. Even the brushy that year, like if you put the boards from that line, there was only really one kind of board. It was like a flat tail, rounded yeah. nose. yeah. And it had great side cut, blended side cut. Totally. The, the thing would erode awesome, even with I ski boots. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Even now. Yeah, totally. That's incredible. And that's an expensive board. So was it used when you got it or was no, it? No, brand new. Holy moly. Yeah, I don't know how he pulled it together. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty amazing. What did he do for work? Uh, he was a carpenter and then he switched over to computer programming. Oh, that's a good move in the 80s mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. But he was like always a kind of a lone wolf type, so he couldn't really make it in the corporate scene, so he didn't really last that long. Yeah. Did you go back to carpentry? Or? No, he went to like just doing it on his own. Oh. Out of his like room in our house. <laughs> that's incredible. But he was able to make a living doing it. Uh, yeah, more or less. Oh, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And my mom worked hard, so. What did she do? Uh, she was first uh, cleaned rooms at, in hotels, and then she moved up to being uh, kind of a receptionist and an assistant to teachers at UBC oh. in a certain department. Oh, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Are both your parents still alive? Mm-hmm. That's, and they must have just been to the moon proud of you, because like, from the moment you got on a snowboard, you were good. I remember seeing you. You couldn't have been more than 14 or 15 years old. Yeah. And and saying like, your style is really good. And like we were saying before, I would have probably said, or 100% would have said, your style is really good for a girl. Yeah. Like your style was good for a guy. I probably would have said that too. I remember thinking that and talking with, you know, like Rob Dow and saying, that yeah. Natasha is like unbelievably good. Yeah, I just remember when I started, for some reason, I didn't have a ceiling of limit in my mind, really. Uh, so I was like already trying to hit jumps when it was like my third or fourth day. <laughs> and like, even I'd like hit the jumps and when the only way I knew how to stop was by falling. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah, but it I wasn't really a physical kid before then. So it took a lot of development and a lot of time on my snowboard to like actually get my body to make it do what I wanted it to do. Well, you went, you started going like all the time. Yeah, as much as possible. Like, cause I, that was, that's always been my mode is just like, go, go, go. So th- th- I would notice you up there like, wow, you're here again. Like, and you would just come yeah. up and y- you had your head down and you were riding fast and hitting jumps. Yeah. It's and, the only thing I thought about. Yeah. Like I was in high school and I had a window from my classroom and it was like right on the coast mountains and I would just stare out that window. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. And I draw snowboarding and I'd like read the magazines and watch all the videos as much as I could. You were full on obsessed. Mm-hmm. What were the videos back at that time? Uh, the Hard, the Hungry and the Homeless. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so sick. That's yeah. a great, that's a great video. Oh man. What an awesome time in snowboarding. So you get up there What's your first contest that you wind up in? Uh, I don't really remember. Um, probably some Grouse Mountain border cross that everyone ended up falling all over each other. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. then the only way to win was just to not fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the contests back then were really disorganized and crazy. And they, yeah. they didn't know what they were doing to build a thing. or Yeah. Yeah, I once watched the snowboard contest, the first one at Grouse Mountain and Roberta Roger was in it and she was the only girl. And I thought that was so amazingly wonderful that I saw another girl snowboarding. Oh, that's so cool. And being in a contest and like, look, looked like she was having a lot of fun. Yeah. Did you wind up being good friends with her eventually down Uh, the road? No, uh, because I took a contest path pretty quickly and uh, she wasn't in that until later on. I think our paths crossed yeah yeah because she was she was doing the free ride thing and filming video parts and stuff like pretty much right away that was pretty awesome so do you move because i remember you're at grouse one moment then you're on option Mm -hmm. how does that happen Um, because you're pretty quiet yeah just people were giving me opportunities and i would say yes yeah yeah 
So that that probably would have been a Rob Dow or a Devin Walsh thing where they're like, hey, you want to be on the team? Yeah, I think it was Devin. Cool. But Rob was like very much right there too. Yeah, they, they were pretty close friends at that mm-hmm. time. They were riding together, designing boards together, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, actually, now I remember. Haha. <laughs> In grade nine, my best friend was Ariel and her dad is Grant. Oh. And he owned Option. Oh, no way. So uh, that was an end too. So oh, yeah. that was like fortuitous. Yeah. Like what is the likelihood that I'd be in a high school in Vancouver with the child of Grant, the owner of Option Snowboards, which happens to be in Vancouver. And then for a few years in the summers, they'd give me a job. So I'd like do the finishing or the packaging. You worked there? Yeah, in the summers to to make money for my season's pass. Oh my God, that's so dope. Yeah. Oh, that's even better than what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So like after your air, you are you on an option board kind of right away? Yep. And was there a women's specific option board at that time? I don't recall. No, I don't think just there a was. small, like yeah, a 141. A yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the free series or whatever mm-hmm. it was, that whiteboard. Mm-hmm. With like a green square on it. Exactly. Mine, my, mine was green. Yeah. I still have that board. Wow, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, those boards. Yeah, it probably still rides too. Like that That board yeah. would have, you know, been a relatively current shape right now. Yeah. <laughs> Rob's still making boards mm-hmm. like a few blocks away from where that option factory was on Venables and Clark in Vancouver in the very same kind of way. I'm riding them right now. They're awesome. What are they called? It's called Wired. Okay. Yeah. And it's his own company. It's kind of a passion project that he's done. And they're really fun to ride. So how many years you do on, on option? You did a few. Um, yeah, I can't recall specifically, but I went to the U S open maybe 98, 97. I don't remember. Yeah. But that's when, um, uh, the Burton team manager named, uh, Bruno, Bruno Musso, I think. Yeah. He was like, Hey, you want to ride a Burton? And I was like, (laughs) yes. And uh, then I felt like that kind of that tearing inside of, being uh having to say bye to grant an option but honestly burton was like on my site like maybe secretly in my mind because it was just like the pinnacle of what snowboarding offered and and in the end it ended up being a really good decision because it connected me to a lot of other female snowboarders that i was able to ride with yeah as well as all the travel opportunity Mm -hmm. and ability to make money through contracts and uh contest incentives and that kind of thing yeah so option would have sent you to the to the open because that was like a part of their program Mm -hmm. i think at that time devin was getting boards as a payment like he wasn't getting money it was like we'll give you a board a month and you can sell that and that'll be kind of your your money or whatever but you would have been like basically a high schooler right still at that Uh, point well either that i think more like my first year out of high school okay and uh, I also remember being sent to New Hampshire with option and just, uh, I don't know what the hell that trip, can't hardly remember, but I was in, in a van, sleeping in a van on the side of this street while everyone else was inside at a house party. Oh my God. And I was like, just so young and like totally shit scared of everybody. And I was like drinking and like, I was like innocent and wasn't a drinker. So yeah, I was like, I need to get my rest so I can snowboard really well tomorrow (laughs) that's pretty awesome and was that an option trip that was yeah holy what and i think i met pat bridges on that trip first time too holy smokes that guy's Mm. awesome hey yeah that's one of the things that's so wonderful about this podcast is like all these people i've looked up to for years and years and years yourself included it's just wonderful to get a chance to talk about like such a awesome time in snowboarding and what it was like for you guys. (laughs) So you're out of high school by the time you get your first Burton contract. Does anybody help you um, negotiate with those guys? Uh, No, not really. Not at, not in that time. Right. It was like free agent. Yeah. Yeah. And like, what about your parents? Uh, They just kind of were like, this is great, but (laughs) I don't think they knew much about anything. And yeah. Honestly, like I was offered money in the first year and that was like something. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It was worth it. And were you torn between that and school? Had you been, had you done really well in school and you were going to go to university or? No, like I said, I just was already on the snowboard program. And when I didn't do well on my final math exam, I just didn't care because all I wanted to do was go <laughs> snowboarding. Yeah. And you were already successful at yeah, snowboarding. At and I actually had a trip planned to New Zealand right after I graduated with my friend. Rad. Uh, my friend Yuho. And we went down there and I did a contest and won and won like a thousand dollars, which paid for my plane ticket to get down there. Oh, that's amazing. My friend's dad bought me a plane ticket. So Holy then I was moly. able to pay him back. Oh, that's so, epic. Yeah. So it was just a really good role. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember you. Oh, she wrote for the shop as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like, what's your crew when you, so you moved to Whistler when you get on, on Burton, is that right? Or did you move to Whistler when you were on option? Mm, no, I didn't move to Whistler until like 2008 oh, wow. or something. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, literally, you could just live in Vancouver and ride the local mountains. But then after a few years, I was already doing so much traveling that it didn't matter where I lived. Yeah. 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 So it's nicer to be in Vancouver for that anyways, because yeah. you got to go to the airport. Yeah. What trips stand out? Where Where did you go where you're like, oh, this is exciting. I'm going to California mm, or... Like so many trips in the beginning with Burton... Uh, just being sent to like Sas Fe, you know, to Europe, being in that crew, you know, with Jim Rippey hitting like the massivest like cat track gap that I've ever seen. Yeah. And I was like going to hit that thing and I was going to kill myself on it. <laughs> and I did a practice jump beside it and blew my knee out. Oh, <laughs> so no. I didn't get to hit that, which it like even now I get the total creeps. Like what the hell could have happened to me if yeah. I like threw myself off that thing? Like. It was, I was just, massive. And I was mental. Like I was like willing and ready to do anything, including die for it. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was wow. that that severe. That's crazy. And, and then towards the end, obviously, I am kind of like get a grip and like realize that there's a whole life to live and I don't want to die for snowboarding. But when I was young, I was certainly that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That. So where was that giant gap with Jim Rippey? Um. It was in Switzerland. I think it might have been Sasfe, but mm, can't remember. Holy moly. Yeah. That's the other thing. I hit my head so many times that there's like a definite fog around so many of the actual names or events that occurred. Yeah. No, yeah. I could see that. So uh, have you been treated for concussions and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I've had more knee blowouts than oh. concussions, but I think the concussions are like a long-term effect. Yeah. You feel it. That that and it's like questionable i'm like yeah i can't remember that and it could be because of the concussions but i can never really know for sure yeah of course of course so burton has you as a contest rider is that yeah. something that you went towards naturally or was that something that they're like hey you're good at this you got to do this it was essentially a more of me wanting to lean in towards where there were more girls mm -hmm. and the contest scene, especially in Europe had more girls mm -hmm. and, um, and events for girls like, and then the prize money was definitely a lure. Right. It was just kind of a no brainer. Like, wow, you, you can do this thing. You really love it. And you can make a bunch of money doing it. Yeah. And then, yeah, the contest thing was really lucrative. And at the same time, I went really deep into sports psychology, like, teaching myself through cassette tapes and books. Rad. So that really helped me get like the mental edge and figure out my own mental blocks and physical blocks that were preventing me or like doing, preventing me from self-sabotaging my effort. And uh, then I even realized how sports psychology bridges really perfectly into real life and that there's a lot you can apply as like mental tools and emotional tools that you can use it with your friends and family or just when you're standing in line at the bank. Rad. Yeah. Cause you were, I don't want to say painfully introverted, but you were pretty introverted as a kid. Yeah. And I'd also have to say that I think in retrospect, that's a lot because I was in the industry and it was all guys mm -hmm. and I felt really intimidated by that. Uh, like I liked them, but I also kind of didn't want to get exposed to getting hit on or getting uh, into, you know, boyfriend situations that are like distracting me from snowboarding. So I think there was like this just unconscious kind of natural introversion to want to 
just put my head down and not really get too involved with that stuff. And I think I would have rather even ignore it and not, not, not allow myself to get too intimidated by guys leering or making comments because then it would have like scared me away and I didn't want to get scared away. Yeah. Yeah. That's an incredible insight. And so did you use that crewing up with the girls? Like once you got on Burton, you were a part of a team, right? You got Victoria. Who who else was on the Burton team at that time? Uh, Nicole Angelroth. Oh, rad. Yeah. 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 Uh, Satu Yadavella. Yeah. Um, uh, and then really quickly, uh, Kelly Clark soon, soon soon came up as well. So she would have been like the kid on the team. Mm-hmm. Were you intimidated that there was an, a new kid on the team or were you excited? Uh, I, I think I really liked her. and But I think there may have been like just a general competitiveness, like just something you have to deal with in that, your own internal chaos. That's healthy though, right? Yeah, we've had a couple of people talk this year on what it felt like to be at the top of your game. And then all of a sudden, like there's, it's, there's no stopping the progress. Like the next generation comes up and they, they didn't start on a Burton Air 5.1. They started on like a twin tip board and they, they had a nice half pipe where they were. So like they're ahead of the game already Mm -hmm. and they're young Mm -hmm. and they haven't had the, a major injury is where you kind of go like progress, progress, progress. And then all of a sudden there's a major setback and you're like, Holy jeez, now now the real job kicks in. Yeah. Like it's exactly like that. Yeah. 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 Cuz you think you're invincible and then when you get that injury, you like come to terms with your humanity. Totally. Totally. Yeah, or your weaknesses. Yeah. So what was that injury for you? Did you uh, have blown out knee? But honestly, like the first blown out knee and then you overcome it and also almost like overcoming an injury for me gave me even a new sense of confidence and strength. Rad. Yeah. Because yeah. I was like, if I can overcome that and write even better now than I did before, then I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But um, generally, like in a larger spectrum of the whole career, I'd say that every injury in a way had a, a, a way of chipping away at me. Uh, uh, kind of like ca- cause it because when you get injured, you have so much downtime. So then you have all this time to think and like go deep and like go within or get distracted. But I, I was doing a lot of like retrospective writing and working on like sports psychology stuff. So in a way, all that downtime kind of, it allowed me to go deeper within myself and realize that I'm more than just a snowboarder and that I have value and, and much to contribute that's not just snowboarding. And I'd even say that the cracks of that downtime uh, kind of allowed my soul to come through. And that um, with every injury, there was like a destruction that occurred, but at the same time, there was a new growth occurring and uh, getting in touch with my soul and like my higher self and, uh, and, and maybe looking for meaning outside of snowboarding. Cause then that's when it flipped when it's like, Oh, I don't no longer want to die for snowboarding because there's actually meaning in the broader world and I'm more than just a snowboarder. Wow. That's incredible. Did you have any mentors during this time? Like when you get the sports psychology stuff, is that from like a team manager or did they send you to a rehab expert or something like that? No, the best sports psychology that I got was through my friend Tara Teagan and she connected me just to some cassette tapes and books. Brad. That I read uh, and like religiously. Right. Yeah. yeah. You seem like you've got that fiery spirit that when you are into something, yeah, you're all about it. Yeah. Like I wasn't really into school, but I am quite nerdy and I like to study and I like to learn and be methodical. That's also how I felt I was learning snowboard tricks was really methodically. Like I'd never won a huck a seven if I didn't know how to land a three and a five. Right. Yeah. And so you'd put together runs based on the best tricks that you could do and then practice those runs and then tack on another thing as you learned it kind of thing. Yeah. And then just to jump out of the contest scene, because that had a run for about five years. And then I'm like, okay, did, did this done that, but there's this whole other side, there's the filming video photos, which I kind of had a taste off with, with Devin and those guys. But then I 
uh, chose to do contests. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to switch my career over to filming and video, which aligned perfectly when Leanne and Fabia um, did girls movies project. And also before them, there was a, a girls uh, out of the UK that, or out of the Europe scene that did a video. And then after that year, um, Leanne and Fabia did mischief. And so then um, that was a really great opportunity to do trips and film with girls and like just kind of hit things that I was more comfortable hitting and didn't, w wasn't scared that I'd die every single time I go out <laughs> snowboarding. Oh, man. Were you of the generation before the intense training for half pipe stuff or did that come along during your career? I think it really just started when the Olympics came and mm. snowboarding was in the Olympics. And then the second time around, it got stronger. And then at that point, I was like, I'm done competing. I'm no longer going to try for the Olympics. And so the third year and then the fourth year, I'm sure that that stuff was intensifying even more. Right, right. So you went to the Olympics for Canada two times? Yeah, to Japan and then to Salt Lake City. So Japan, Nagano, they had half pipe. Oh, yeah, I remember mm, it. Yeah, yeah, 98. Yeah. So you would have competed against, you know, Shannon Dunn. Who won that year? It was... uh, I think I likely Nicola Thost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. from Germany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How were you doing on the World Cup? Like, would you were you a contender? Were you? Uh, I was a contender in Salt Lake because I had been ranked first in this season coming up to it in, in all those uh, ISF Rad. World Qualifiers. No. FIS yeah. world qualifiers. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my attitude towards the Olympics was kind of like, didn't really dig it. Yeah. You know, when Terry boycotted it, I was like really on that page. I was like, I, I really get that like snowboarding and the corporate of the Olympics is such a weird mix and it's definitely going to change the sport. But it, I still went. And it did, right? Like it totally did. There's before the Olympics yeah. and then... Yeah. Look at where we've got to now. It's like there, you couldn't make money yeah. at contests right now. It just wouldn't. And also you're putting your life on the line. Like that's something that happened with snowboard contests is that the jumps and the half pipes, everything got so much bigger because we're showcasing it on TV. So it's, you got to go bigger. Not because the athletes are pushing, saying like, hey, we want to try bigger tricks and we want to do, you know, a little bit, but more because it's a spectator sport with, you know, and it should be money on the line, but it's not. It's with the Olympics, it's more prestige, really. Yeah, it's prestige. But from what I understand with the jumps getting bigger, I think it was a lot of athlete push wanting bigger, but safer jumps. Safer. Right. And that people were wanting to, to go past the 10s and into the 12s and 14s. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you they, were, been there. they were needing that, that airtime. Yeah. Yeah, so they were pushing. Okay, so that's good to know. That's what it feels like. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, because before FIS, you did a bunch of ISF stuff. Mm -hmm. And to me, the feel of the ISF was like a lot more rider driven. There was a lot more rider input. Right? Yeah, it was cooler. Yeah. Like every event was its own individual thing. It had like a personality of its own. Mm -hmm. And then on FIS, it feels like it's just a cookie cutter event that every single one that you go to, it's only the location changes. Yeah, they knew that that's what they had to do in order to make it something they could put on TV. You know what I mean? Like they couldn't have some quirky event yeah. that, that they didn't know how to announce or judge or. Yeah, and it's just those governing bodies. The Olympics are like, we need a governing body like ice skating. Yeah, yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer. Yeah, it's cool that you were on that, that Terrier he 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 became the kind of like namesake of resisting the olympics yeah and the longer it goes on the more you see how right he was about everything like the olympics is a terrible money monster machine that just chews up cities and puts them in debt and it and pits like it's this nationalistic kind of thing that's it doesn't have much soul, you know? It, it definitely is not about the progression of any of its sports. It's about the monetization. Yeah, or more like a platform for advertisers. Oh, big time. To, like, jump on the back of this thing. Yeah, so when you went to the Olympics, who who were the Canadian team uh, sponsors? Uh, I don't remember. McDonald's, probably. Uh, no, uh, Roots. 
Roots. Okay, uh, that's I, a good one. But I really one. don't remember. Yeah. I'm sure it was McDonald's too, probably. Sure, sure. It's and then you've, you're on this etiquette where it's like you know you're doing the yeah interviews. It's just, and, there was a bit of sad to me because I was like the whole year I ride for my snowboard sponsor, and all of a sudden my snowboard sponsor is not even kind of even allowed to show its logo. On yeah, this thing. yeah. It was it was a representation nightmare. I remember that. Bummer. Did you ever think, well, maybe your life would be completely different had you won the Olympics? Uh, not really. No. No. It wasn't your vibe. Yeah. I'm glad that you were able to direct your career in, in such a way that, you you know, like when, when you tell Burton, I'm going to go film in the backcountry with these crews. Yeah. Or I'm going to go film. Did you film street stuff and backcountry stuff? or? Yeah, both. Yeah. Yeah, I think that directing my own career is a huge thing. It was like what really made it fun and creative. And so then to like have a success at the Olympics kind of uh, pigeonholes you in a certain um, expectation and puts you into a broader light. And then there's a lot more demand placed on you from people that really have no interest in your well-being. Right. So there was like a subconscious resistance to wanting to expose myself to that. Cool. I think that's generally why I didn't do well at the Olympics. I just wasn't mentally up for that. Right. So you didn't train for it like you'd trained for everything else. No, I did, but I like I literally sabotaged my effort. Wow. Yeah. And did- like uh, I was had a p- picture in Sports Illustrated of me basically casing it in the half pipe of like hitting the lip with my snowboard bent right over the lip like a sandwich. I remember that shot. And then it like getting projectiled out of the rebound of that thing straight into the flat bottom. So yeah, that was my Olympics glory. But I I don't care. It didn't bug me. I was like, that's just how it is. But there's so much more to do. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And then you did it. And then you Mm -hmm. take a hold of your career and you film. Yeah. How long does the filming stuff last for? Uh like another five years. Amazing. So I'd say about 10 years of a solid, like productive career. Yeah. When you look at your career, do you prefer the contest years to the filming years or do you prefer the filming years? Was there a freedom that you found with filming that was like just so much better? I just, I really loved all of it. Yeah. And there was so much to gain through the contest and such a beautiful thing to travel to all these different cities where the venues were. And, uh, then just like the freedom and the creativity of filming and uh, photos. Yeah. So do you ever become Natasha the partier? Like, do you take a, <laughs> do you? No, but <laughs> when I retired, I had this boyfriend who was really into partying and I was like, I was 30 and I was like, okay, now I have to party because that's what everyone else does. So I'm going to go and like hang out with this guy and his fun friends. Yeah. And like get it out of my system and just like party. But then I I wasn't even a a partier. I was just there watching partying. (laughs) But at least I showed up. You know what is funny? I met that guy. Yeah, that guy, he was like 10 years younger than me. (laughs) Yeah. So you're getting the way to go from all the the girls in your crew? Yeah, kind of. It's all good. Okay, so let's talk about your retirement. Oh, yeah. Well... It is like around 2008, and I got sent to New Zealand with Burton and Aaron Leyland to film with me and Kelly Clark. Brad. And we're heliboarding, and the conditions are good, but I'm right into a bowl, and the whole thing fractures around me like <laughs> massive, massive blocks of snow. And I'm at the very top of the mountain, right at the um, like the upper bowl of it, and the whole thing sucks me down the mountain all the way to the very bottom through a boulder field. Oh. And I, I'm like riding the whole thing out with just like savage snow all on top of me and around me. Just there's no chance just getting sucked down and like completely with all this amount of snow on top. And like, I'm like bracing my face and, and try and keep my board in front of me. Cause I'm thinking at any second, I'm going to smash into a rock and I get sent off a cliff with this thing, and it still keeps taking me down all all the way to the very, very bottom. And then, uh, but luckily at the very bottom, it fat started to fan out because it like got funneled all that snow, and then all of a, at the bottom it was getting spat out of the the gully. And uh, and at that point, the level starts to of the snow. It's out over my head, and it starts to slowly uncover my head, then my shoulders, and I'm still moving. 
and then my my whole body until at the very end I just start writing it out so I didn't actually get buried but I did get sent down this thing and it was like totally traumatizing huh. and Aaron Leyland was in a heli filming the whole thing and uh so at that point I was like basically that was the end of my career in my mind and in my heart because I was had like 10 good years and I'm like at that point, I'm thinking, why do I want to risk my injury or death for something that I've like had a good run on? But I, it's I, to be honest, I'm not that in love and obsessed with it anymore as I used to be. And I had this vision of a future that I wanted to have family and do other things. So it was very easy for me. Like a year later, I was just like, uh, I'm just gonna like not renew my contract with Burton, and I completely stopped snowboarding. And uh, literally didn't snowboard for at least five or six years since I retired. And that was pretty good too, because then my body got a reset. Because right. all that snowboarding and all that physical little aches and pains and all that constant grinding and in little mini injuries and big injuries took a toll on me physically. So it was good to just like reset my body. And now my whole stance on snowboarding is my child now, he's six and he's asking to go up. So like, I'm going to go up snowboarding with him to like, take him up and show him and my daughter, but she's not as excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll like get back to snowboarding, but it's definitely not a push for me. Right, right. Like you're not coming out of retirement to go film a new part or to go in some contests yeah. or something like that. And even like, I know the joy and the like absolute like flow and love you can feel when you're on the best sunny day on a powder day. And I miss those, but honestly, I find my life so fulfilling that I can even like not necessarily do much of those days and feel like I'm missing out. Right. Right. How do you feel um, like becoming a mom? Did you become a mom while you were still a, a professional snowboarder? No. Um, it was a few years after I retired yeah. that I became a mom. And did you read a bunch of books and do the same thing that you did with everything else uh, in your career? You know, a little bit because yeah. I needed some like good reassurance and kind of education about the female body mm -hmm. and like just having kids and giving labor to babies is like really like put me in awe of like the amazing power and the wisdom of the female body and how we don't really talk about it in our culture or it's not exemplified too often but still the information is out there. And then when you're kind of being put through the gauntlet of having to deliver a baby and all the pain and the, and the like focusing that needs to occur and that single mindedness that you need to do it with. Otherwise you're kind of like, ha don't really have a good chance at doing it successfully. Um, that, that takes as much courage and strength as it does to send your body off a 30 foot cliff. Yeah. And and it's like the innate female wisdom and power that that women have and so I was really in awe and like in a lot of reverence towards being able to have that experience as well. I love that. You mm -hmm. really put that really well. That's incredible. So uh, while you're saying that I'm thinking of your experience with the avalanche did did that come into your mind at all during the laboring with either of your kids like hey, I've gotten through where I've been buried under snow and I'm going to come out the other side and this is going to work? Or was that just like the furthest thing from your mind? Like the kind of an avalanche experience had a way of maybe fortifying me mm -hmm. like into like my character to make me more tough or more like endurance. Mm -hmm. But the thought of the avalanche doesn't help me in labor. In fact, just like a clear mind and not thinking about anything except breathing is how I successfully was able to do it. Incredible. Did you uh, practice yoga or stretching or mindful breathing throughout your career? Uh, not so much. I don't think I was really that hip on yoga through <laughs> um, snowboarding career. Right. But then towards the end, it just started becoming more popular so and more well-known and widely practiced. So I definitely did go into that in my 30s, uh, just yoga classes, meditation, breathing. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, that's a daily practice for you at this point or not as much as I'd like it to be now because having kids, I'm so busy oh, and yeah. I'm like, feel a bit like run down actually. Cause it's like so full on. And then whenever I'm not 
doing the mom thing, I ha- I'm like wanting to paint, paint with oil and brushes on canvases. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Your well. art is absolutely phenomenal. Was there a progression? Like, were you good at it right out of the gate or did it did it take years and years to get to where you're at right now? Well, when I was in high school and I told you about all those art classes I took. Yeah. So even then I was showing that I had a good talent for it. Cool. I was producing work that a lot of people were like, wow, that's super good. You're amazing. But then snowboarding came and I was tunnel vision. And I always knew in the back of my mind, though, that I would go back to being an artist and being more focused on producing works. And uh, even now, though, I do wish I did more of that while snowboarding. But it just, while I was in snowboarding, it just seemed so full on that, and I was so tunnel vision that I just was like, no, I can't paint. I have to just wait. But now in retrospect, I wish I had done it because it would have been a really good thing to be more well-rounded. And balanced, right, mm-hmm. right, right. And and maybe even produce artwork to be uh, used on snowboards or in for the company. The stuff that I'm seeing, like any one of your works would have been just unbelievable on a snowboard. And now I hope to bring my art to a community, even though I don't necessarily know for sure if it has to be the snowboarding community. Right. But any body of people that are receptive to my artwork because I feel like my artwork is there for a reason. Uh, like I have a philosophy of why I do it and why I'm intent on doing it so much. And one of the reasons is because I feel that too many of us are embedded in consumption of entertainment and that our world is kind of collapsing into various array of problems like the the common well-agreed problem that our environment is being neglected or now we're seeing kind of a collapse of information narrative and like the polarization happening with different groups of people based upon their belief system um, and what's going on with social media and certain alternative media as well as mainstream media creating uh, these bubbles of um, consensus and yeah. that these um, consensus bubbles actually serve to profit someone and to have people it disorganized and against each other and not in agreement and willing to fight each other actually benefits someone at some point. Totally. So for me, art is a way to be a content creator. I feel aligned with that because it's through the meditation, for example, and even use of psychedelics in like healing opportunities. There's the sense that my soul needs to be communicated on the planet Earth now. And it's that I'm not here just through my ego interface, but a higher sense of myself connected to a God or where we are all more connected to each other at a dimension where there is more connection that that can now manifest on our 3D world, which is the opposite of this polarization that's happening. And that one way to do that is for us to not consume as much content, but to create our own content from our own heart and from our own life's experience, to tell our own stories, not to be fed stories from some higher up who uses stories to control us in our thinking in some way. To, for profit. Yeah, but for right. us to be in touch with what is our own dream, what is our own vision, what is our own story. And for us to share that and be brave enough to share our voice and our stories with other people so that hopefully we can gain the attention of everyone, but it's coming through a more sincere and legitimate place, not because I'm hoping to bank on it or control people. Just I'm I'm more hoping to engage people and invite people. And in an ideal world, you know, my art would even help to activate people to want to present the world with their own form of art like yours is the podcast yours the podcast is your form of art and i think everyone has their own material or their own mode and it doesn't even have to be art it could be engineering or it could be healing uh gardening cooking you know the it's a huge variety but it's simple that the more time you spend in your passion project is or connecting with people is less time you spent 
watching and consuming media. So the math is simple in my mind. I love how impassioned you are about this. Like, I don't think enough people are connected to, you know, some people call it their true purpose. That's how I feel about the podcast. When I'm doing it, like when I'm speaking with someone like yourself, I feel great for, for days and days and days, you know? And, and the time when I feel the worst is when I turn to the internet for what I think is inspiration, but inevitably it turns to self-doubt. It's so easy to see stuff that is, I mean, it's engineered to show you things that make you feel like, oh, if I just buy something, I'll feel a little bit better. Oh, if I just get a cool jacket, if I get a new thing, like everybody's snowboarding better than me. Everybody's podcasting better than me. And I'm sure the listeners are starting to get tired of hearing that because they're very, very supportive and say, okay, keep going. That's the most wonderful thing. And I'm sure you're getting that with your art, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Find your purpose on, on the planet. You'll know it when you're doing it and you lose 10 hours of your life. There's no greater gift than shutting off your social media. And it could be as simple as going for a walk. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of thing you're talking about, like, I think that in engaging in that kind of a activity or putting your time into that is very generative. So it has a way to generate for you good feeling or good energy. And often I think things like going on social media or the advertising sphere is quite demoralizing. I think often advertising acts on the function of demoralizing you in some way to make you think that you're inept or inadequate in some way. So therefore you need to buy this thing in order to become whole again. Yeah, totally. You mentioned psychedelics, which is one of my favorite topics. I, I've um, come back to it as a, as a mature, yeah, somewhat person and with some sort of purpose. I really like the idea of skipping over the entrenched ideas in my brain and having the connectivity of creativity to different parts of me, like whether it's how I parent my kids or how my relationship with my wife or more importantly right now with my parents, solving the problems that I've, you know, been struggling with for my whole life through creativity, not through more effort in the wrong direction. So I found, you know, psychedelics to be very, very helpful. Yeah. So I did try psychedelics when I was in my teens, but then when I was in training for years and years with snowboarding, I didn't touch that anything because mm -hmm. I just didn't, I was actually afraid of it and didn't think it was anything worth my time and probably would be injurious to my effort as a snowboarder. Yep. And then uh, towards the end of my career, actually by the influence of listening to people like Terrence McKenna, uh, through um, online, like uh, audio recordings of him, I started to get curious about psychedelics. And in a way, he gave me permission to try it on my own and kind of gave me the information and the skill, described the skills needed to be able to take like a dose of mushrooms at home alone in the dark and use it as a way of introspection and to uh, gain more insight and uh, understanding about myself and about my habits, for example, and how my habits may uh, uh, influence my behavior or my decisions in a way that's not beneficial to me. So you can use these things to start to deconstruct uh, your habit and yourself, but if done in a responsible way. And I felt that that was something for me, but I'm not sure if this medicine would work for everyone, but I was just very receptive to it. That's so cool. Yeah, I would, I guess we should put some sort of warning in the show too. Like, hey, look, if you've never tried psychedelics and you're just listening to this and you're thinking, hey, maybe I'm going to try them. You got a lot of work to do before you're ready to, you know, dive into that pool. It's, it, it takes, it takes some you know, experience. It's really nice to have some, someone help guide you. I mean, whether it's um, a, a person in real life or, or Terrence McKenna online, 
you yeah. know, set and setting is everything. Set and setting really, um, for any drug, really, including Advil. Like if you expect it to work, then it usually works. And if you expect it to hurt, then it's going to hurt, you know? Um, yeah, I, I'm fascinated that you came to psychedelics through, but you've always been a bit of an alternative person, right? Like choosing a career in snowboarding as a woman in the nineties was not, a, it wasn't a path that had been blazed by a lot of people. Yeah. I think I'm a rebel type personality, <laughs> but my form of rebellion wasn't maybe the type of rebellion one might expect, like yeah. uh, being a punk or getting, um, savage with like drinking at a party right or, or like destroying something but yeah. just rebellion in my own way like at every step of the way somehow wanting to do it my own way and really questioning the norms and what's being disseminated as the proper way to do things when oftentimes it's not really thought through well yeah so i think i i really believe in the power of thinking through things for yourself and deciding for yourself and empowering yourself, whether your decision is something that's right for you or not. Yeah. I mean, hearing you in this conversation, how close you were to self-harm with snowboarding. Like I, I know myself, I used skateboarding as a form of self-harm. Like if I would get in a fight with a girlfriend or a breakup or something, one of my favorite things to do was to go skateboard until I fell and was bleeding. Like it just felt better. Like... Oh, it was like such a release to be actually injured. And it sounds like you had some of that, possibly. I might be uh, projecting that on No, you. I think I had that. Like, that was an unexamined part of me. And it was a real motivator and a driver. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it's just not realistic and it's not sustainable. Absolutely. Yeah. So you have to rethink the strategy mm -hmm. and find new meaning and new purpose. Yeah. And definitely, like examine it what was that about what you know what what is it about the physicality of um being hurt that you know for me something physical is fine but something emotional isn't real it felt like it wasn't real was it as i'm getting older i'm realizing look the most real pain is the emotional pain yeah oh for sure and that was actually quite fascinating to me because even in the beginning with sports psychology even though it wasn't oriented towards spirituality they still talked about emotions and how they're such a influence and uh infor inform how you think and behave so would they recommend using emotion to get yourself psyched up for Winning a contest, for example? They would recommend to be in touch with your emotions, but when you're on, you're on. And then that's when you have to be aware that there are emotions, but then you have to use physical triggers and cues to trick your brain into thinking specific emotions that are help you to be in the flow for your competition. But they, but they really um, specify that you have to be in touch with your emotions when you're on the downtime and really work through that stuff. Because if you don't, it'll come back to haunt you. And it'll be like maybe a cascade of emotion that you won't be able to cope with or handle when you're in a pressure situation. Oh, that's so in incredible. Yeah, I've definitely had emotional downtime right away after like a wonderful day, or even after a scary day. Like I'll some uh, last year, I was swept in a very small avalanche in the year two or three years before that a little bit bigger one and i went on to have an okay day actually i went on to have a great day last year it was like one of my favorite days of the year but i drove home along the highway and i was really emotional i cried a lot and i was like i knew i'd made the decision to get a snowmobile but i also knew what that meant for my risk level like, I was like, this is going to be amazing, but it's also going to put me at risk, which is really friggin' scary. And uh, so it's interesting to hear you talk about the emotional downtime, especially of something like a competition. Like, if you win, is there less risk of an emotional downtime or is it just the same? Uh, it's the same because there are real life, cons uh, real life events that occurred as you were growing up and in your even day life as you're an athlete that need to be properly dealt with or 
accepted and processed. Does that make, does that explain it? Yeah, kind of like they, because of competition being a heightened state of awareness, it can bring that stuff to the surface. Is that basically uh, just when the the p competition is the pressure. And if you haven't properly dealt with things mm. that are like, not fully, uh, that like unhealthy things in your life, then that pressure can cause you to crack. Got it. So therefore dealing with your emotional triggers or obstacles in life yeah. first and trying to square that away with maybe journaling or meditation or therapy counseling yep. and just not burying it. Right. So properly dealing with it then will give you a better foundation from which you can really tap in and access the flow state. Rad. Yeah. So like you obviously got into the flow state when you were snowboarding and you can do it now with painting, right? Yeah. I think that it is a failure of Western civilization that we think we're the pinnacle of human achievement. And so few people even experience the flow state. It's like you can imagine as someone who's um, lived in a flow state that there's got to be a great way to break that down and teach it to people. And why wouldn't we be doing that in our school system? Yeah. Well, sometimes the modern school system is criticized for being set up in a way to teach kids how to be cogs in the machine, mm -hmm. how to be uh, just productive uh, workers. Mm -hmm. But now our society and our technology is changing so fast that even that system of teaching children may soon become quite irrelevant. I think you're right. I think you're really right. I think, like you said, you getting a psychedelic education online is like, that's a new option. The people that studied them in the 60s and 70s did a lot of them. But then by the 80s and 90s and 2000s, it was like completely off the table. So psychedelic research really stalled out there for like 30 years. Yeah. And now it's coming back with mm -hmm. a lot of research and a lot of funding and mm -hmm. test trials and all sorts of different psychedelics like psilocybin or MDMA. Yeah, for treating treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress, which a lot of the people that are listening to the show were semi-pro or professional snowboarders. And there's no way you got through a career without having some form of PTSD. Oh, definitely. Right? Like yeah. you either broke yourself off, yep. you saw someone get broken off. Mm. You st a lot of people in the backcountry have seen friends be in fatal accidents. Like there is a lot of trauma yep. in snowboarding. Yeah, I'd like to add to that because so that we can be responsible towards psychedelics in this conversation is to say that the psychedelics are not the cure and that the they only tap you into a new way or bridging new pathways in your brain, but it's up to you to do the work to integrate the psychedelic session. And it has to be done over a long period of time with meditation or journaling, self-reflection, conversations, or doing art even. And, and it's through this practice and acquiring these new habits that the actual healing can occur, but it's not right to just expect for the magical cure to happen overnight. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that. I really enjoy psychedelics, but the integration was always a far off dream. Yeah, that's work sometimes. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Where's Natasha Zurich these days? I mean, you've already said you're going to snowboard with your kids. Are you you're painting professionally? Is that what you've chosen? As your profession, uh, yeah, you it's think? moving there. Like, mm -hmm. I like to say that I live a boring life, but I'm not bored because <laughs> it's it's enough for me to live in the Okanagan now, and it's enough to go out running the trails a couple of times a week, be there to raise my kids and focus on producing art and developing my talent and my visual language. And I think that in a way, this is part of my service to my friends and my culture. And I'm really hyper-focused on, again, I'll mention it, that I wish for us to revivify our culture and redefine it and, and redescribe it in new ways that are more life-affirming for the planet and for ourselves and to highlight the connection between humanity 
so that we can heal the rifts and the polarization because I see it only getting worse and and it's like scares me and it's hard to to even sometimes wake up in the morning and not feel a sense of dread but uh I feel like the art is like an anchor for me to pursue something that is mm, true, beautiful, and good. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. It's been an absolute pleasure to reconnect with you, Natasha. You're a wonderful human being. You always have been. Thank you for doing the show. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I think I really appreciate your enthusiasm and your good energy. And just to see how happy you are to be having this conversation with me. It's so great, Natasha. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Evanrad, shout outs this week to Natasha Zurich and her whole family. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for doing the show, Natasha. Check out Natasha Zurich Art and buy something that Natasha painted. It's incredible art. Mog418 sent me an Instagram message this week that was super rad. Thanks, man. And thanks to all you listeners out there that have reached out this year. You guys are the best. Special thanks to Nick from Salmon Arms, who created a rag quiz from the Ben Billock episode and then gave away a signed pair of Ben mitts to the winner. Sam Clement, who won those fair and square by answering all the quiz questions properly. Stay tuned for more rad shit like that, and be sure to come back next week for another episode of the F and Rad Snowboard Podcast, presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.